Well, hello, Internet, and welcome to part three of my object-oriented design tutorial. Unlike parts one and two, which are available above and you should watch them, in this part of the tutorial, we're going to be covering iterative development, the unified process, and I'm going to take you through a real-world usage case. Now, the beginning of this tutorial is going to be a little bit heavy in regards to jargon because I have to explain a whole bunch of things. But as this tutorial progresses on, it'll become more real-world and more interesting. Feel free to leave any questions or comments below. Now, the water waterfall process is one in which you do everything up front and hope nothing changes. That's kind of what we did in part one and two. We jumped directly into requirements lists and then we started diagramming and then we wrote the code. Now in small projects that may work, but in larger projects you are going to find that the iterative development way of diagramming systems and designing systems is the way to go. Now the iterative development process is based around creating a system in many small small pieces. Programming actually starts before all the requirements have been defined because requirements are expected to change as developers receive feedback and improve upon their basic design. Now the unified process is the most popular form of iterative development. The final system is created in many blocks and up front you mainly focus on the parts of the system that are the riskiest or the most valuable. You are then going to get constant feedback to verify quality of your system and you're going to focus on the core parts first and then add additional functionality. Now the unified process which we're going to be going over in the next parts of this tutorial organize work across four main phases the inception, elaboration, construction, and transition. In this part of the tutorial I'm going to really focus in on the inception part. Now there are seven parts to the inception process of the unified process and we're going to focus on the core goal of the system by creating 10% of the use cases that we will then start actually programming in the elaboration phase which is going to be in part four of this tutorial. Now the purpose isn't to define all the requirements the goal is to find out if all those involved agree about the goal for the system. You want to be able to answer, does everyone agree that this is the goal worth solving most of all? Now the parts of inception is the vision process in which you are going to define the most important goals and create an executive summary. Then we're going to get into use case modeling in which we're going to define names for most use cases and analyze approximately 10% of those that are the riskiest or provide the most value up front. Then we get into the supplemental specification in which we're going to describe briefly other requirements that are going to be needed for our system. Then we'll get into risk management plan which is going to discuss the biggest risks and how they can be solved. Proof of concepts is going to clarify the vision for the system. The iteration plan to describe what to do in the first elaboration iteration. And if you're not quite getting all this, don't worry about it. I'm just giving you an overall view of everything. Digest as much as you can and feel free to move on as be things become more interactive as we move on here. Then we're going to get into the software development plan in which we're going to describe the time needed for each iteration. Remember, we're going to be writing all this code and creating creating our system as a whole in blocks, in pieces. And the goal above all is to make sure everyone involved in the inception phase completely understands each other and the overall plan. And whenever I'm talking about requirements, you're going to be defining requirements using the unified process. And our main goal here is going to be finding while tracking requirements that are expected to change. And if you try to define all the requirements from the beginning, like we did with the waterfall plan, which we did in part one and two of this tutorial, chances are very well that your project will fail if it is sizable in any way. Now the unified process requirements are structured based off of what is called the FERPS plus model. And this breaks down into functional, which is going to be all your features and security, usability, which are going to be those parts of your system that are going to help your user directly, reliability, which is going to be how are you going to recover from failure, performance, which is going to be based on speed, accuracy, and proper resource usage, and supportability, which is going to show how your system is going to be maintained as well as be configurable in the future. Now the plus side of FURBS is going to include four or main parts, which is going to be implementation, in which you're going to list resource limitations and different tools or languages that you want to use. The interface, which is going to cover interfacing to external systems. Operations, which is going to cover system management. And then finally, licensing. 
So then we get into the meat of this tutorial, which is the use case, or as I like to call it, the usage case, which I like much more as a name. Use cases are going to provide a simple way to discover and record system requirements. You're going to start a use case by writing a story about how each actor or participant in your system will use your system. And an actor is anything included in or uses your system. This could be basic users, admins, computers, databases etc. And there are three basic types of actors. You're going to have your primary user, which is going to be the person the system is designed for, supporting actors, which are going to be external computer systems, verifiers, and sometimes people, and offstage actors, which are going to be outside elements that have an interest in your system but aren't key to the system's primary use. So then, what is a scenario, which is every use case is going to be built on a very specific scenario. A scenario documents a series of interactions between actors and your system. And each actor could have numerous scenarios while interacting with your system. As an example, some scenarios might end successfully while others will end in a bad way or will be considered a failed scenario. And the use case is just going to be a collection of scenarios involving your system and an actor. For example, we're going to be focusing again on working with an ATM machine and a common scenario we might have here is cash withdrawal from checking. Alternate scenarios might be account is out of funds or PIN is incorrect. Your job when creating these usage cases is to cover all of those scenarios. And there basically are three use case formats. First you have brief, which is just going to be one paragraph that describes the main successful scenario. Casual, which is going to be many paragraphs that cover many scenarios and then full dress which is what I'm going to really focus on here and it's going to list every step and variation written out in detail. Now when using the unified process we're going to focus in on scenarios that are going to cover the most important 10% of your system up front. And the most commonly followed fully dressed use case format is the Alistair Cockburn format. And that is what I'm going to cover in this tutorial. So let's get into some real world system design. Here you can see on your screen the basic format of the Alistair Cockburn format for creating usage designs. And the very first thing you're going to do is provide a use case name. Now this normally should begin with a verb. And what we're going to do here is go provide ATM user with money from checking account. Remember, this is one scenario and this is our goal. Then we're going to go into the scope which is going to be the name of our whole system. And I'm just going to call this ATM software application. Kind of doing this out of my head. This is normally done using numerous different people. And then you're going to get into level, which is either going to be user goal or sub function. Now, most of the time it's going to be user goal. The only time you're going to have this listed as sub function is whenever it's used for duplicate interactions. For example, if you wanted to document an interaction that's going to be used in numerous other users, cases rather than repetitively just writing the same thing over and over again you would just type in sub function and have it work this way but in this situation this is going to be a user goal and our primary actor who is going to be the main participant in our system is going to be bank customer remember I'm just focusing in on the most common things we're going to be doing here then we get to stakeholders and these are going to be all actors involved and their role in our system and basically you just have to think about all the people that could use our system. Well, bank customer is definitely going to be one of them. The ATM machine itself is going to be one of them. Your bank, home, office, computer would be another one. And then finally, let's say fraud department to check if a card is fraudulent or not. Well, then after you list all of your actors, then your job in the stakeholders area is to basically list all of the requirements these different actors are going to have whenever they use your system. So a bank customer is going to have access to all all the funds in both their savings and checking. They may also want to deposit checks, check their balance. I'm just doing a lot of this out of my head. So I'm just sort of like thinking through. They want to make sure their money is safe. And then uh, they want to receive a receipt. Okay. And then what you're going to do is you're going to continue going through here and figure out all the different things that all these actors need. So the ATM machine itself is going to provide funds available to customers. 
automatically update fund changes immediately so that if two different people are accessing the same account, we don't have any type of problem there. Protect the bank and customers from false cards or pins or whatever. And I'm going to type out a whole bunch of other ones and there's a link under the video to give you a more precise example of this. Bank Home Office, number one, is going to provide accurate account funds information. And you would normally do this in a team format where people would just basically be yelling out exactly, you know, different things that you would want to include. And it would also be nice if people at the bank were there to also provide information, which they normally would be system wide. There you are. Update immediately when a transaction occurs system wide and a whole bunch of other things. Like I said, under the video, you can get the whole entire list. I'm going to write out a whole bunch for you guys. And then we'll have fraud department. If sent card information, they will verify if a card is stolen. Okay, so after we list all our actors and the main things that they want to get out of our system, then we're going to go into our preconditions. And these are, quite simply, everything that must occur at the point in which the system is prepared for execution. So, a valid card is entered. Technically, power to the ATM machine, but I'm just going to start here. Is entered that matches. I mean, Normally, you would just type out everything and then worry about getting it perfect later on. That's the whole process of this. Okay, so valid cards entered and a valid pin is entered. Okay, and then we're going to be able to execute some things. Post conditions. Customer is happy with the transaction. The transaction is disseminated to all bank systems. Maybe we want to have a photo of the customer is taken to protect against fraud or something like that occurring. A uh, receipt definitely needs to be generated. And um, the only other thing I think of is card is provided back to the customer. So there's some examples of some post conditions. And then you're going to create your main success scenario. And this is just going to be a step-by-step -step list of interactions that will occur during the most common successful scenario. So you're going to list out everything step by step and then what you're going to do down here under extensions it's going to be a step-by-step -step list of interactions for other alternative scenarios outside of the norm and you're going to see some examples of those here so let's get back to the main success scenario so we're going to have the atm displays a message on screen identifying itself to customers and we're just going to do this step by step and we're going to say customer inserts their card the atm verifies the legitimacy of the card and let's just jump down here to extensions as exactly something we could play with here and spell legitimacy correct okay so down in extensions what you're going to do like i said before is cover scenarios outside of the norm and i always have have extensions here that are basically going to start off with at any time. So what is an at any time outside of the norm thing that could occur? Well, if the ATM runs out of funds, well, we should definitely have something that we want to do if that occurs. So we might say display a closed message. And then we're going to say shut down the machine and then send a message that a tech Mission needs to fill the ATM with funds. And what's another example? And this is a star, and you're going to have a letter, and that's going to be the thing that you're going to do with this. Well, another thing that could occur, and in this situation, we're going to put a B inside of here at any time if the ATM runs out of what's something else that could run out. Well, receipt paper. Well, display closed message, shut down machine, send a message to the technician that needs to fill the ATM with paper. Now let's jump back up here again. The ATM is going to verify the legitimacy of a card. Well, there's a lot of alternative scenarios that can occur. And those alternative scenarios should not be listed here. They should be listed down in extensions. So this starts off with a number three. So if we want to list things outside of the norm, we're going to go 3A down here so that we can pair those two. And we're going to say the card is from another bank. That's something that could occur. And then we're going to list some alternative things that we're going to do here. So we could say connect to the other bank to verify funds. Now there's another alternative scenario. We could say the other bank isn't reachable at this time. Okay, so there's something we could do. Now what are we going to do in that situation? So we don't skip over it, we just keep going. So if the bank isn't reachable, we want to inform the customer 
that a transaction can't be made. And what else could we do? Well, we could provide the customer with their card. You know, that would be good. And anything else? Uh, well, let's just say end transaction. And another thing could be for and provide the customer with a receipt. So that would be nice to do as well. And I can't think of anything else. So the bank isn't reachable. What are some other things that could occur under here? And that is our goal here is to figure out all these different things. One of them could be the other bank is reachable. And then we're going to list what we're going to do here. If the, put in another number, we could say something like if the customer must pay a fee, inform them of that. And then let's throw something else under here. Another thing you could do is just put like an I in there, kind of like a Roman numeral. You could say something like receive verification that the customer understands any fees. Another thing we could do, actually, let's throw this under here. And these Roman numerals and things are starting to get a little crazy, but this is the way it is. We can say add the fee as part of the transaction if the customer allows. And then we say if the customer declines, record that and provide the customer with their card and receipt and so forth and so on. So that's what you're going to basically do. You're going to list out the main scenario with a step-by-step -step interaction or list of what's going to happen in the situation in which our ATM is going to provide users funds from their checking account, which is the use case. And then you're going to have all the alternative things D down here inside of extensions. Like I said, if you want to read some more, I got a whole bunch more under the video. Then the final thing, or the next of one of the next of the final things, is special requirements, and this could be something like the text must be readable by color blind people, and something else we would have is the text. Let's just copy this. Must be readable by people who speak other languages and you know other things like they must be readable from three feet away or some way to handle braille and so forth and so on so there's going to be special things that we need to cover and we're going to have data variations lists and this is going to provide specific information on the type of data that's expected like data types or special hardware data types or something like that and other special requirements might be time instances like transactions Actions should take no longer than 10 seconds, things like that. But uh, data variation in this situation is uh, all data uses 256-bit AES encryption. That could be an example, you know, a data type or ways of passing data. With frequency occurrence, you're basically just going to list how often the system will enter a new scenario. In this situation, that could be constantly. If they cancel the current transaction and move into another one, we have to always be prepared for that. And then the final part of the usage case is going to be some random things that come up during the discussion, like is there anything we can do to improve user experience for the blind, for example, or something like um, can polarized screens help improve security you know like weird sort of things like that questions that we want to get answered so there you go that is a rundown of a usage case and how they're actually created in the real world when one is using iterative development versus waterfall development in the unified process. Feel free to leave any questions or comments below. And in the next part of the tutorial, I'm going to get into the elaboration phase. Till next time.